Our first speaker this afternoon is an independent journalist, a witty and insightful writer, and a pastor. Before entering ministry, he worked as a journalist for News Limited, um, writing for Brisbane's Courier Mail and Sydney's Daily Telegraph. He still writes opinion pieces for the Australian newspaper, The Good Source and The Spectator. He's a vice president of Alpha Crucis University College, the largest Pentecostal training college in Australia. And prior to that, led Christian, a Calvary Christian Church across nine campuses in Australia and South Africa. Can you please join me in welcoming James McPherson? I can um, hardly wait to hear myself after that introduction. You made me sound incredible. You're all going to be incredibly disappointed. I'm so sorry. I've I feel like we should give you your money back, except you didn't pay to be here, so it's all right. So we're good. Everyone well? Happy? Cool. What time do I finish this session? I just need to know, because I heard about this preacher who was incredibly long-winded. He used to drone on for hours and hours and hours, much to the frustration of his congregation, but they were all too polite to ever say anything. Well, one Sunday, he'd been going for an hour and a half, and he was still on his introductory remarks. When finally a young man in the front row, he could stand it no longer, he just got up and walked out. Well, the preacher was irate. He thought, I'm going to track that young man down later and have a word to him. And he did later that afternoon. He said, what could have been so important that you walked out in the middle of my sermon? The kid shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I had to get a haircut. Well, the preacher was furious. He said, why didn't you get a haircut before I started preaching? He said, well, I didn't need one then. <laughs> so, what time do I finish this session? One... 1.45. So a.m. or p.m.? <laughs> 1.45. We better get going, hey? All right. Now, there's a few young people here. I am going to use a word that mums and dads may want to cover their ears just briefly. But it's not Sunday, so I figured we'll, we'll be polite tomorrow, but here we're just going to talk honestly. Is that all right? Oh, you're all looking at me suspiciously. <laughs> <laughs> but the kids are suddenly leaning forward. They're off their phones thinking, oh, this is going to be good. In June 2021, a female patron of Koreatown's Wee Spa in Los Angeles was shocked to find a naked man in the change room. She promptly complained to staff but was told the man had a right to be there because he identified as a woman. In a video of the altercation that went viral, the female customer can be heard protesting, I see a dick. It lets me know he's a man. He's a man. He's not a female. Her argument is well thought out and eloquently presented. Let me summarise it for you. Men have dicks. A person in the female change room has a dick. Therefore, there's a man in the female change room. But staff at the Wee Spa were unimpressed and unmoved. They continued to insist that they could not ask the person with the dick to leave the female locker room since that would be discrimination and therefore unlawful. The offended woman continued arguing. It's okay for a man to go into the women's section, show his penis around the other women, little girls, underage. Wee Spa condones that. Is that what you're saying? The video shows a male patron of the spa approaching the woman and asking if she was talking about a transgendered person. There's no such thing as transgender. He's got a dick, she retorted. The Christian Post newspaper reported the incident as, quote, highlighting the brewing tension between single-sex spaces and gender identity non-discrimination policies. They should consider renaming their publication the Christian Sit on the Fence Post. The incident in the Wee Spa does not highlight the growing tension between single-sex spaces and gender identity non-conforming policies, but rather it highlights the brewing tension between sanity and insanity, between normal people trying to go about their lives and the weirdly abnormal people who've turned the whole world into a woke spa where the only thing being massaged is your brain. Normal people understand that a man walking around with his penis hanging out is a man. Normal people also understand that even though a man might wish to be a woman, his wishes don't change the physical reality of his situation, which is that he's a man with his penis hanging out in the women's changing room. So why did a video of a woman doing nothing more than observing reality and reacting as a normal person would react go viral? Why did so many people find it fascinating to watch? Could it be that we've reached the point in Western civilization where simply being normal is seen as an act of bravery, even heroism? Have we now arrived at a stage in history where courage is required to say what normal people would say and to react the way normal people would react in any given 
situation. It should not require courage to explain that men have a penis. But so many normal people have gone quiet, hiding their common sense and keeping the normality to themselves that normal people are now regarded as something of a curiosity. Where once history was decided by a clash of religions or by a clash of ideologies, the history of our age has come down to a clash between normal and the abnormal, the sane and the insane. Have you ever watched the TV news or perhaps flicked through your local paper and thought, is it me or has the whole world gone absolutely mental? If you feel like the world's gone mad, you shouldn't be surprised. It's exactly what the Apostle Paul predicted in Romans chapter 1. Let me read it for you. He says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even the women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Paul goes on to say, Furthermore, just as they didn't think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what ought not be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and that's just the Victorians. They are gossip, slanderers, <laughs> God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do them, but they approve of those who practice them. Now, I've always read that passage and thought, okay, I, I get it. Paul is describing what you might call a moral breakdown in society. We get that. And I think we switch on the news, we see a moral breakdown. We read the paper, we see a moral breakdown. But Paul is describing something else that most people miss in that passage. And it's a bigger problem than a moral breakdown because if you don't fix this other issue, you can't solve the moral breakdown. It's not just a moral breakdown, it's a mental Breakdown. It says, professing to be wise, they became quite stupid. Thinking became depraved and their minds became darkened. Now, how many of you know we all go a little mad from time to time? Not you, the person next to you. <laughs> and, and you know exactly how it happens. Have you ever wanted to do something that you knew was wrong? And, and so you're going to do something that you know is wrong, but, but, but you don't you're going to feel guilty and you're going to feel ashamed and, and no one can live with guilt or shame. So we become experts at rationalisation. We justify the indef indefensible. We convince ourselves that, well, the normal rules don't apply to me and, and if people understood my situation, then, then, then they wouldn't you know, view me so harshly and everyone else is doing it. It's not that bad. And, and we can actually convince ourselves that right is wrong, up is down, and death is life. Now, now you understand how you can do that personally, but imagine if an entire culture did that. You would literally end up with a world that had lost its mind. And as I said, you can't address a moral breakdown if you don't first address the mental breakdown. There's a moral breakdown because we've all gone quite literally insane. And so I want to talk to you for the next three and a half hours on <laughs> symptoms of a society that has lost its ability to think clearly. And if we've got time, I'll, I'll give you six of these. If we run out of time, you just have to ask me over coffee. But let me give you six symptoms of a world that's completely lost its mind and, and lost the ability to think. Here's the first one. We're convinced by pithy slogans rather than by sound arguments. If you notice, no one argues anymore. I actually love to argue, but I can't find anyone who wants to argue anymore. No one argues. Instead, they just repeat slogans and believe that by repeating them ad nauseum, that settles the matter. You know, God says in the book of Isaiah, come let us reason together. God would be so lonely if he visited Western culture in 2022 because no one wants to reason, argue or debate. We simply chant slogans as if they're an argument and believe that settles the matter. Let me give you some you might be familiar with. Marriage equality. What does that even mean? And yet many people were convinced to vote a certain way because of that simple phrase, marriage equality. It doesn't even mean anything. Are we saying that the marriage between a man and a woman is equal to the marriage between a man and a man or a man and a preteen? Or what does marriage equality even mean? What about this one? Love wins. 
It sounds wonderful. It, it almost sounds like an argument, but it's not. It's a great bumper sticker. It's a slogan. But what does love actually mean? Do we mean that we think the love between a man and a woman should win, and we also think the love between a man and a, a child should, should win? Or do we? It, it's, it's not an argument. Here's what our culture does. We take a complex issue, like same-sex marriage. It's not me saying it's complex. Penny Wong, a lesbian parliamentarian in the Labor Party, she herself said in the lead-up to the debate, this is a complex issue. She said there's cultural, religious, historical reasons why this is complex. So we take a complex issue, like marriage, uh, gay marriage, and then we reduce it to a slogan, like love wins. And here's the, here's the secret. The slogan has to be impossible to disagree with. Who would disagree with love? What, you hate love? What, you don't like equality? So, so we take a complex issue, same-sex marriage, historical, religious, cultural issues there. We reduce it to a slogan that you cannot disagree with. Love wins. And then we repeat the slogan ad nauseum until we think the issue is the slogan. So then if you disagree with the issue, we accuse you of disagreeing with the slogan. And so if you don't vote yes to same-sex marriage, you hate love and you hate equality. It's a very clever trick that has been perpetuated on a culture that stopped thinking. What about this one? You're on the wrong side of history. You ever heard anyone say that? You know what they mean when they say you're on the wrong side of history? What they mean is shut up. History's a blank page. History hasn't been written yet. To tell someone the wrong side of history that hasn't even happened is at best foolish and really just incredibly arrogant. Uh, if you don't believe uh, what we believe, then you're going to be steamrolled by the future. So you might as well give up your beliefs and adopt mine. That's essentially what they're saying. But how many of you know history's never decided? Nothing is ever final when people try to intimidate you by saying you're on the wrong side of history, they're, they're not presenting an argument. They're just telling you to shut up. What about this one? The science is settled. You've heard someone say that. Oh, the science is settled. That's another phrase that means shut up. Because all great scientists became great scientists by overturning the prevailing wisdom of the scientific community. The science was settled that the earth was flat until Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan circumnavigated the world in the 1500s. The science was settled that the universe had always existed until in 1964, Robert Wilson discovered thermoradiation, proving the universe did have a beginning. Scientists call it the Big Bang. The Bible just says, God said, let there be light. The point is, science has always been about curiosity and investigation, not about consensus and certainly not about shutting down discussion. But we live in a culture, and here's the first symptom of a culture that's lost its mind. It no longer argues about anything. It just chants slogans over and over believing if they chant slogans often enough, we'll take that as a convincing argument. And so we need to be people who learn how to think and talk things through rather than just chant slogans. Cody, did you get that point? Good. Number two. Are you okay? You happy? There's no more rude words in this sermon. So you'll be all right. Number two. We grant... Here's a second sign of a... a Culture has literally lost its mind. We grant a person successful in one field of endeavour authority to speak on all fields of endeavour as, as if they were an authority. It, just because a man sings well doesn't make him an authority on every other aspect of life. Rolling Stone magazine uh, read an article headlined uh, some time ago, Bruce Springsteen calls Donald Trump a moron. Now, I don't know if Donald Trump's a moron or not. Um, I, I do know this. Springsteen is a brilliant guitar player. Uh, he's got more musical ability in his little finger than most of us put together. But just because you play guitar well doesn't give you any special insight into the psyche of Donald Trump. Springsteen's understanding of Donald Trump's psyche is about as newsworthy and valuable as that of my local shopping centre janitors. And, and I'm not having a go at Springsteen. He's just answering a question he was asked. But don't you think it's bizarre that the media ask Bruce Springsteen's position as if playing guitar gives you some special insight that the rest of us don't have? Uh, Fox News ran an article headlined, Brad Pitt seeks to understand Donald Trump's appeal. Well, I'm still trying to understand Benjamin Button. Uh, <laughs> and, and frankly, I'm not surprised Brad Pitt doesn't understand Donald Trump. He couldn't figure out Angelina Jolie. And, <laughs> and, and I'm not having a, a shot at Brad Pitt. I'm just saying he was asked a question. It's weird how the media would think that... See, see Brad Pitt, he's, he's brilliant at acting. Like there are few people on the planet better at pretending than Brad Pitt. You, you can write words for Brad, and Brad will say them as if he were you. That's 
He's genius. He earns millions of dollars doing that. But just because you're good at pretending to be other people doesn't mean you have special insights into US politics. Um, this one was my favorite, um, a publication called The Hill. It's a political publication in America. This was the headline, Pink Floyd rips Donald Trump's ridiculous border wall idea. I was trying to work out why would the media ask Pink Floyd what they thought of Donald Trump's border wall, and then I realized they once put out an album called The Wall. <laughs> and so that obviously would make them experts on border policy and immigration. See, Obama was brilliant at politics, but just because he was brilliant at politics didn't make him an expert on Islamic theology. I used to wonder every time Obama lectured us that Islam is a religion of peace, when did they stop calling him commander-in-chief so he could become theologian-in-chief? Uh, Bill Shorten, some time ago, said there's no contradiction between Islam and Western liberal democracy. Bill Shorten was a great union organiser. I just didn't realise he was also familiar with the Quran and the Hadiths, that he was thus able to assure us that uh, Sharia law is perfectly compatible with Western civil liberties. Here's the point. If my child swallows a coin, I'm not calling my accountant. <laughs> and, and don't misunderstand me, my accountant is brilliant with coins. He, he can tell me what goes here and what goes there, he, but, but that doesn't mean I'm going to ask him to remove a coin from my baby's throat. If we insist people fixing our pipes know something about plumbing, why don't we insist the people on the project pontificating about religion know something about that which they're pontificating about, and yet we tune in nightly as if they're saying something profound and meaningful. It's interesting that we get so much of our news now from comedians and celebrities as if somehow they knew something that we don't. It's called the dumbing down of culture, and we participate in it daily. Here's the third point. Are you okay? All right, well, I'll, I'll try harder. Because um, here's the third sign of a culture that's lost its mind. We're easily offended. Some of you were offended by my introduction. <laughs> you know, one, one of the symptoms of a culture that's really become incredibly infantile is, is we get offended by everything. Uh, just a couple of years ago, a 63-year-old pensioner named Alan Sorrento uh, he was from Rhode Island. He wrote a letter to his local newspaper, the Barrington Times. Um, that, well, let me just read you the letter he wrote. Um, the editor of the newspaper published the letter in the letter to the editor section under the headline, Please Women, Put Away the Yoga Pants. Uh, th this is the letter that was published. The absolute worst thing to happen to women's fashion is yoga pants outside the yoga studio. Not since the miniskirt has there been something worn by so many women who should not have it on in the first place. Yoga pants are everywhere, on women of all ages. What a disaster. Like the miniskirt, yoga pants can be adorable on children and on younger women who have the blessing of nature's youth. However, <laughs> on, on adult women, mature, there's something disturbing about the appearance they make in public. Maybe it's the unforgiving perspective they provide, inappropriate for general consumption. Yoga pants belong in the yoga studio. What next? Men wearing Speedos in the supermarket? Imagine if men did that. Yuck! To all yoga pant wearers, I struggle with my own physicality as I age. I don't want to struggle with yours. <laughs> Thanks, Alan Sorrento, 14 Napton Street. Now, can you imagine poor old Alan's surprise when the day after that letter was published, 300 yoga pant women wearing women turned up on his front lawn <laughs> to protest? Protest organiser Jamie Burke said, we're fed up with the policing of our wardrobes. Sorrento's words stuck in my gut. I would suggest that when a letter from a pensioner you've never met to a local paper you've never read so infuriates you that you organise 300 people to protest on the poor guy's front lawn, your yoga pants are too tight. <laughs> we, we live in a culture that is very quick to take offence. We now have a culture that assumes if I say something that upsets someone else, that is evidence of a, a crime having been committed. You say, well, I was offended by that. To which I would reply, and? Have you noticed when you get offended, nothing actually happens? The Bible says we walk by faith, not by feelings, but we've become a culture that thinks with our feelings, reasons with our emotions, and so we're perpetually offended. You know, uh, the result is that we're not allowed to say anything at all. Uh, politicians are scared to say what a woman is. If you, like me, watched as the politician Alex Antic asked the head of the health department of this country, can you tell me what a woman is? And he said, 
I'll need to get advice from my department. <laughs> the guy's not stupid. He's not being smart. He's just incredibly intimidated because no matter what he says, people will get upset. And about the only thing we agree you're not allowed to do anymore is upset anyone, which means you're not allowed to say anything. Now, let's forget about who's out there and talk about who's in here because the danger is that in the church, we're going to bring the spirit of the world into the church and we're going to cause churches to become places where the pastor is almost not allowed to say anything because someone will get upset. And you should get upset in church. Because if the Bible is the word of God, it's going to run counter to a lot of the things that I would like to do or a lot of the thinking that I have that's been shaped by popular culture. At some point, God's word is going to cross my opinion. And so I wouldn't give two cents for a church in which I'm never offended. I hope most Sundays there's something that offends me because it, it cuts me to the core and causes me to have to reassess my mindsets and my behavior. If someone offends you, deal with it. Ask yourself, why is it that when someone I've never met wrote a letter to a newspaper I've never read, I got so angry? What is it about me that reacted to that? Now you've got an opportunity to grow as a person. But when I insist that any opinion offending my sensibilities is somehow wrong, I never grow. So we've got to be people committed to growing, which means when we get offended, we should be more concerned about why we're offended than about who did the offending. Does that make sense? I can see you're all so impressed by that. If you keep responding this well, I'm going to move on to my 27th point. I'll just keep, keep going. Number four, we're almost done. Here is the fourth sign of a culture that's lost its mind. We've outsourced our thinking. Now, you're all country folks, so you're probably not as bad as, as us in Sydney. Uh, but, you know, we've outsourced our cleaning. I don't clean my house. I get someone else to do it. We've outsourced our lawn mowing. Why, why would I do that? We've, we've outsourced education. I, family over here who homeschool their kids, you guys are mental. I, would, I send my kids to school to get them away. Um, but we've also outsourced our thinking. Um, in March 2012, a group of Japanese students drove their rental car right into Brisbane's Moreton Bay. Uh, they were trying to get to Stradbroke Island. Uh, when they were interviewed by the Courier Mail, they said, and I quote, the GPS told us we could drive there. We got stuck. There was a lot of water. <laughs> now, they could have looked out the windscreen, but instead they just did what the machine told them to do. And this happens all the time. I was at Brisbane Airport recently. I got into the elevator, and as I got into the elevator, a voice said, doors opening. Thank God, because I wouldn't have known <laughs> unless I'd like, looked. Uh, and then I, I'm going down an escalator and uh, there's literally a voice at Brisbane Airport. It says, hold on to the rail, control your luggage. So I grabbed the rail and gave my luggage a stern talking to. <laughs> I, I was at a, a, a travelator in Singapore and, uh, you know, they, they, they go for miles. And then uh, just as you come to the end of the travelator, there, there's a, an automated voice that says, uh, prepare to walk. Um, <laughs> which again, thank God, because I, I would have just fallen flat on my face. Um, it, it's almost like we're being conditioned not to think. Why would anyone condition the population not to think? I wonder. You know, they did a study in Europe of uh, traffic accidents and uh, they were trying to work out how they could reduce traffic accidents and their conclusion was quite um, counterintuitive. They found the more traffic signs, the more traffic accidents. And their conclusion was, the more signs there are, the more you expect to see signs. And so you don't even think anymore. You don't even drive. You just point and shoot. And if there's a corner coming up or a crest or you need to slow down, there'll be a sign to tell you. And so they actually decided to get rid of traffic signs. And to their surprise, traffic accidents decreased exponentially in proportion to the decreasing of traffic signs. There's a thing happening in Western culture right now where we're literally being conditioned not to think. It's happening everywhere. It's happening subtly. But the scripture says we ought to love the Lord with all our heart. We're very good at loving God with our heart, with all our soul. But it's also with all of our mind. Last, last point. And really, I just said all that to get to this point. You say, well, why would you bother with all of that? Because I had to fill the time. 
It is the fifth sign of a culture that's lost its mind. And, and this one is in the church. We've deified tolerance and we've demonised intolerance. We've come to believe that intolerance is always wrong. And we've come to believe that to be intolerant of anything is hateful, narrow-minded, bigoted. And we've come to believe that tolerance is always right. We've come to believe tolerance is always charitable, compassionate, enlightened. But how many of you know to be successful, you need both? Here's how you should understand it. Tolerance is for people, never for bad ideas. Intolerance is for bad ideas, never for people. In other words, we're meek with the erring but violent with the error. Jesus said, love your enemies. Notice you've got some. He said, love your enemies. He didn't say love your enemies' ideas. To accept someone and to agree with someone are two very different propositions. When you fail to differentiate between your enemies and their ideas, you end up loving ideas you should hate and hating, idea, uh, hating people you should love. So you've got to understand what tolerance and intolerance are for. Tolerance is for people. And how many of you know we need tolerance for people? Because most people who hate Christianity and hate the church don't really hate Christianity. They hate the caricature of Christianity they've been sold. And they don't really hate the church. They hate the impression of church that they've got. And I was at a funeral some time ago. I didn't know the deceased, I didn't know the family, but it was in my church. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll be there. And there were a lot of people there. And uh, to be honest, at the wake, I was bored. Um, and I was looking around, there was a guy sitting on his own. And I thought, oh, I'll go and talk to him. And as I walked towards him, I said to someone, do you know who that guy is? And they said, yeah, he's, he owns like a whole lot of um, adult stores right through North Queensland. I thought, all right, the funeral just got interesting. So I, I sat down with him and I uh, said, what do you do? He said, I own a few um, adult stores. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm the pastor of the church. He immediately like, turned from me physically. I thought, was this going well? <laughs> and I asked him a few questions. He replied with one-word answers. And, um, you know, when it's clear, they're not interested in talking to you. And so you, you try and figure out a graceful exit. And so I'm sort of looking for a reason to... to and then I felt God speak to me. And um, I just felt God say, well, just talk to him about stuff he's interested in. (laughs) Are you sure? (laughs) Um, He said, so, um, you know, when you meet a 15-year-old, you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a cricket player. I want to be a Formula One driver. I've never met anyone who said, I want to own a a string of sex stores through North Queensland. At at what age did you decide you wanted to do that? He told me how he got into it. And I said, so, like... I run a church, we've got multi-campuses, it's like franchising, so, you know, we kind of, I, I get, fra- how many stores have you got, is it, is the, are the finances centralised or localised, how do you manage your staff, HR, etc. We end up having a good chat, and uh, we're getting on quite well, he's a, a nice kind of guy, and, and then midway through the conversation, he, he says wistfully, never thought I'd ever be in a church again, I thought, gotcha, <laughs> I said, how come, he told me how struggling with his sexuality as a young man, He'd started going to a church. He told me the church. And uh, he said when they found out that he was struggling with his sexuality, they stood him up in the middle of a service, told him to leave, and told the congregation to have nothing to do with him. As he's telling me this story, he's tearing up. I I actually started tearing up too because he's a really nice guy. Um, Camp is a row of tents, but really nice. And, and, um, And I did what any of you would have done. I put my hand on his shoulder. And I said, hey, you need to know, Jesus would never do that to anybody. And if you ever came to this church, we would never do that to you. What they did to you was wrong. He kind of wipes his eyes. I kind of wipe mine. And he looks at me and he says, who do you reckon this looks worse for? Me, a pornographer, being seen with a preacher, or you, a preacher, being seen with a pornographer? I said, dude, this is bad for both of us. So that <laughs> shook hands and that was the end of now, I wish I could say I've seen him at church and he gave his life to Jesus. I, I've never seen him again. But I, I do know this. If he ever decides he wants to try to find Jesus, he knows where to come, where the door will be open. For, well, tolerance is for people. We're always tolerant with people because Jesus loves people. But tolerance is only for people. It's never for bad ideas. Intolerance is for bad ideas. And, and we need intolerance. Um, you know, if, if engineers weren't intolerant of bad math, bridges would collapse and people would die. If doctors weren't intolerant of uh, unhygienic uh, facilities, then more people would die in hospital than recover. If police weren't 
uh, intolerant of, of speeding drivers, um, I'd have a lot more money and more points. Um, so if, it, if it's right for engineers to be intolerant of bad math and doctors to be intolerant of bad hygiene and police to be intolerant of running red lights, why shouldn't Christians be intolerant of bad ideas about reality? Society wants us to have faith with no dogma, which is itself dogma. Right is right, even if no one's right. And wrong is still wrong, even if everyone is wrong. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Not sometimes graceful, sometimes truthful. He was at all times fully gracious and fully truthful. He just knew what was for what. Tolerance and charity are for people, not for bad ideas. Intolerance and clarity are for bad ideas, not for people. So, so we need to be both tolerant and tolerant at the same time. Charity for people, clarity for ideas. When Jesus hung on the cross, he was tolerant and intolerant all at the same time. Intolerant of sin, that's why he was nailed to the cross, whilst fully tolerant of people. That's why it was him and not us. The scripture says, for God so loved the world. That's charity that he gave his only son. That's clarity. The scripture says, neither do I condemn you. That's charity. Now go and sin no more. That's clarity. The scripture says, Christ came to save ch sinners. That's charity. Of whom I am chief, said Paul. That's clarity. The Bible says, it's the goodness of God. That's charity that leads men to repentance. That's clarity. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, that's clarity. He forgives us and cleanses us. That's charity. See, clarity without charity just condemns people. On the other hand, charity with no clarity, just causes us all to sink into a bog of sentimentality. The Bible says we're to be as wise as serpents. That's called clarity, clear thinking. And as gentle as doves. That's called charity. I feel we're in danger of being a lot like doves, but having no serpent to us. And we need both. Let me finish with this scripture. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of love power and a sound mind you know there's a lot of reasons to be afraid these days i mean say the wrong thing on social media you'll get cancelled say the wrong thing at work you'll get sacked say the wrong thing to this person i'll never speak to you again there's a lot going on in the world right now. it would be easy to fear but the scripture says no, no we shouldn't fear we, we should actually walk through life exercising power in our culture and and, and Paul tells Timothy, here's the way you, you have true power in your culture. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of, of power. And then he uses two more, he says, of love and a sound mind. Well, what are they? What's love? Love is charity. What's a sound mind? Clarity. Love for people, but hard-headed, clear thinking about ideas. We live in a culture that has literally deified tolerance. Tolerance isn't always right. It's always right for people, but never for bad ideas. And we've demonised intolerance. But intolerance isn't always bad. Sometimes intolerance is a very healthy thing. Never for people, but always for bad ideas. And if we can understand the difference and make it work, then we start, rather than being irrelevant in our culture, we start to have power to change it. And everybody who believed that punched the person sitting beside them in the shoulder and said... He was better than I thought he was going to be. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it.